Hey, I'm Owen from Urbane Cyclist Worker Co-op in downtown Toronto, and I'm one of our in-house Brooks Saddle enthusiasts. So unsurprisingly, I'm very excited about today's video. We're taking a deep dive into the world of Brooks bicycle saddles, and Brooks are world famous and revered for their ultimate comfort and durability. These saddles have been largely unchanged since they were first introduced in 1866, with the exception of a few newer designs. These saddles have been the number one choice for cyclists that demand comfort, whether you're touring across the country or just cruising around your local neighborhood. We're gonna be discussing why Brooks saddles are ex an exceptional choice. In this video, we're gonna do a detailed run through of the Brooks saddle lineup. We will be going over some of the different shapes, materials, and construction that Brooks use across their lineup and give you some insight into choosing the right saddle for you along with how to take care of it and make it last. We're focusing on single rail mounted saddles, this means we'll be talking about the B17, the Flyer, the Swallow, the Swift, the Team Pro, and the B67, but we'll not be going into great detail about the B66, B72, B33, B135, or the B190. These styles are all compatible with modern style seat posts, while the saddles we're not covering today uh, are more at home on traditional or vintage bikes, which require a double rail clamp and a pillar style seat post. While the double rail are, and heavily sprung saddles are very fun and obviously quite comfortable, they're not likely to be someone's first Brooks saddle. So this video is aiming at being an introduction to the Brooks leather lineup, and we want to make sure that we are focusing broadly on compatibility with just about any bike out there. So a little elaboration on seat posts. So right here we have a basic seat post. So these have a single bolt for adjustment, and the single bolt is in charge of both angle and fore and aft or back and forth adjustment. So this has a spline system. So the benefit of this is it's quite inexpensive, but the downside is this is a pretty crude system. This can sometimes create a little extra pressure on the front and back, which can sometimes cause saddles, not only Brooks saddles, uh, their rails to bend or break prematurely. So it's a little more preferable, is something that's more adjustable, being a double bolt system. So these are a little better uh, produced. They have less of a high stress area at the front and back. There are also more angles of adjustment with these types of uh, seat posts. So another system that is also a double bolt is the Velo Orange, and this is the long setback seat post, which is again a very popular option uh, in conjunction with a brook saddle because some people find the brook saddle don't have a lot of adjustment for and aft or forward and backwards and this can give a little extra range in the total adjustment of a saddle. So and when we move to the double rail saddles and when I say double rail I mean some of these big heavy hitters we're not really talking about as much today. There's this specialty double seat post uh, rail and this only works on old school straight pillar type seat posts. So these aren't commonly used on most modern bikes and this just drops right up on top. So totally functional. You could buy a pillar seat post for a modern bike if you really wanted to make one of these old school, big double sprung or triple sprung saddles work on your bike. And a little side note, you can of course buy these traditional seat post hardware to make a pillar seat post compatible with single rail, meaning any of these seat posts are cross compatible with a single rail system, but pillar style seat posts are a must if you have a double rail system. Brooks has also just released an adapter that will allow you to use double rail saddles on a modern seat post. It's called the Brooks Sandwich Seat Adapter and slides between those double rails to allow you to use the saddle on a modern seat post. So a little personal story about my experience with Brooks. Before I ever worked in a bike shop, I was still riding my bike a lot, and I had ridden just kind of whatever came stock on my bike. And I didn't have any serious issues with comfort, but the more I rode, the more I felt I needed to upgrade my saddle. At the time, I didn't think much of it, and I just bought what I thought was a reasonable yet basic inexpensive saddle to replace the worn out saddle on my vintage road bike, which was for me a huge mistake. This was beyond uncomfortable and I could hardly ride it for any amount of time, so before I went to the store and bought another saddle that I wasn't sure if I was going to like, I buckled up and did a bit of research. So the brand that kept popping up when I was researching and reading online was Brooks, and countless happy customers were raving about the unparalleled comfort that these saddles offered. City cyclists, hardcore roadies, world tours alike all seemed to agree that these were some of the best of the best. I reluctantly purchased a B17 standard from Urbane Cyclist, and I was immediately converted. 
Although many people say there's a long break-in period for Brooks Saddles, I found there was an immediate difference in comfort and it only got better with time. So keep in mind, just about any saddle won't feel perfect when you first set it up. Often, there are new or different pressures at play and it can take a bit of time for your body to also get used to a new saddle. All told, Brooks has continued to be one of my top choices for myself, but also my most discerning customers. So a little history about Brooks as well. In the early days, most bicycles had sprung saddles. So that's saddles with big springs, like the one we see here. So these functioned as the primary point of suspension for the rider. The tradition of unsprung saddles, on the other hand, which has now become the norm, only came into favor from racing traditions, trying to shed weight wherever possible. So in this video, we're focusing mainly on the unsprung saddles, but we'll include a little bit of information about some of their sprung counterparts too. So of course, we ask, why Brooks? Brooks saddles are very simple, but extremely effective. I like to compare the construction of a Brooks saddle to that of a hammock. The nose and tail of the saddle are usually made of a steel frame, which the leather top is riveted to. This means that the leather will actually flex under load and conform to your body, reducing pressure while also offering a stable and supportive platform. The leather is very breathable when compared to a modern synthetic, and leather top has very low friction. Less friction means more comfort. So on the other hand, why might you not want a Brooks saddle? There are a couple instances where I would personally not recommend a Brooks saddle. For example, if you're in a very aggressive position on a road bike, uh, the metal nose is not gonna be favorable for this as riders tend to put weight on the nose of the saddle and in these positions. And similarly, if you're riding uh, highly technical or cycling aggressively off-road. Shifting weight back and front uh, will force you onto either the metal back or front, which again isn't super ideal for comfort. To start things off with our detailed run through of the full Brooks line, we're gonna have the B17. So this is what I would consider to be the benchmark of the Brooks lineup. It's simple, it's classic, it's good on many setups, and it's what I myself got my start on. I would consider this saddle mid-sized as the shape is not terribly wide, but overall it's fairly broad and flat in shape if you compare to some of the more race-oriented saddles in the Brooks line. One of the primary reasons this saddle is so popular is that it can be comfortably ridden in a moderate range of postures and on many styles of bikes. Brooks lists the ideal back range of this angle for around 60 degrees. And to elaborate further, you'll notice a lot of these new Brooks saddles have this handy little chart. So they're gonna range in uh, uh, angles from 90, 60, or 45, dictating how forward your back is gonna be and what the ideal kind of posture for each saddle uh, it's intended. So the B17 here is available in a few traditional colors. We have the black B17. We of course have the antique brown and the honey color variants. There are also some special edition colors such as blue, green, or red, which we don't have presented here. There are also softened, also known as aged variants as well, which have a texture more similar to a suede and comes in more of a pale brown color. It does also have a shorter breaking period because it's softer from the start, just as the name implies. You'll also see on the softened B17, it has the same holes drilled through at the bottom and the same lacing as you'll see on the carved variant of the B17 to help give structure as it wears. Brooks also does make a special variant. Uh, so these saddles come with hand hammered copper rivets and they also have a hand skived edge, uh, which resists any possible curling you might get from extended use. This copper rivet upgrade was originally not offered directly from Brooks, but back in the day, racers would opt to drill out the stock steel rivets and hammer their own softer copper rivets in, which eventually led to Brooks offering that as a stock option as well. This isn't only aesthetically pleasing, but also materially more forgiving on the leather portion of the saddle. The larger surface area of these rivets in combination with the softer copper, put less strain on the leather, which will have everything sitting more flush with the outer profile of the saddle, reducing potential additional friction for the rider. So you have a little closer look there. You can see that nice flush, broad copper. It's also just really handsome. You can see this hand cut edge we were talking about as well. So that's resisting specifically outer curling uh, when under load, some saddles, especially when they're nearing the end of their life, can tend to splay a little outwards. The B17 is also available in a titanium variant, and this is available with titanium rails and frame assembly, but still has the same copper rivets. And yes, 
there's still more in the B-17 lineup. There's also an S variant of some of the saddles, which I'm holding here, a B-17S Special. This was traditionally referred to as the women-specific or short saddle shape. Many women are perfectly comfortable on the B-17 standard, but most men will not find this shorter S variant comfortable. The overall shape is effectively the same, and I'll pull this up to compare a little bit, but the nose is just a little shorter. Brooks also offer a carve, formerly known as the Imperial version of the B-17, which has a cutout design to reduce pressure under your undercarriage. One notable difference with these is they come with a few different leather laces and a series of holes drilled across the bottom edge of the saddle. Due to that cutout, the structure of the saddle is a little less rigid and will tend to splay outwards with use. These laces, when tightened across the bottom, will help the saddle hold its overall shape. And additionally, there is also a narrow variant called the B-17 Narrow. So here's the B-17 Standard and the B-17 Narrow to compare a little, to get a little reference for shape. Overall profiles are very similar. Uh, from the side, it's gonna look just about the same, but you can see from the top. And of course, all the Brooks leather saddles are stamped in the side to give you an idea of exactly what you're looking at, even without the package. So the B-17 Narrow is probably a little narrow for most people's purposes. Brooks calls this specifically our narrowest saddle for sprint performance. So this was traditionally used as a racing saddle for track, uh, but, so it's perfectly suited for a retro track or retro road build, but most people's intended usage, it's gonna be a little bit narrow. Uh, I usually ride quite a narrow saddle, usually most narrow in a product line, but in this case, I find this overly narrow. Uh, it's gonna be really race, only usage. And of course, if you're uh, looking at the narrow saddle or you're kind of interested in this, they still are available in the traditional colors of antique brown, honey, and black. And this is also available as a cutout or also known as imperial variant. So moving on to some sprung options here, we have the flyer. The flyer is effectively a sprung version of the B-17 standard. This means we can see the same color options as we talked about previously, and we can also see the shortened S variant as well. So before we get into it too much, this is a flyer, and that is a B-17. You can see the upper portion is effectively identical. The big defining feature there is that big sprung back. So. Just a simple single rail, so it will still work on any modern seat post, just like the B-17. So the shape of the leather portion, again, directly comparable to the B-17, and if you've ridden a B-17, you'll have a fairly good idea of how the flyer will feel overall. Both the B-17 and flyer models are quite at home across the board on gravel, road, hybrid, touring bikes, and more. And both of these are still in that 60 degree intended usage range for that back position. So the springs are the obvious differentiating factor between the Flyer and the V17, uh, which make the, the saddle change a little in angle slightly throughout its uh, motion. Um, the Flyer will feel a little more at home in that, in that regard on a city or Dutch style, perhaps even a cargo bike, anything with a maybe slightly more upright position. Uh, and the difference of the angle is very nice in my opinion when the weight is centered more towards the back of the saddle. But if you are leaning more forward and maybe in a more road oriented position, it might be a little less favorable as you'll end up uh, more on the nose and kind of pivoting the nose up unintentionally. So here we have again, uh, probably the most broad offering with single rail from Brooks. This is the B67 and this specifically that I'm holding is the B67S. The B67 is a little more broad in the back uh, which indicates again, its intended usage is gonna be close to that 90 degree range. It's definitely designed this way for a reason, but it also means it's a little less versatile overall when compared with the B17 or perhaps the Flyer. So similarly, the B67 is available in the antique brown, the black, and the honey, uh, in addition to the short variant, like you see in my hand, uh, and also the softened material, that lighter brown we talked about before. The softened versions will still have that imperial kind of feature where you have the drilled out bottom so you can keep it taut due to the softer leather, again, fighting that potential splay over time. And I think this is probably one of the best possible upgrades if you have maybe like a little more of like a heavy duty city bike or perhaps like a more modern electric pedal assist bike and you want something with a little more forgiveness, a little extra spring and a little more, you know, feeling like a seat more than a saddle in this case. 
And a little reference here, we have the B67S with a flyer standard. So those are gonna be your shortened version of the B67. Again, nice big springs, a little extra comfort, but still nice standard rails for lots of compatibility options. So moving on a little bit closer to what we would refer to as the road or racing style saddles, we're gonna start off with the Swallow. So the Swallow here is one of Brooks' most long-standing race saddles. Uh, and this, in my opinion, is a very natural regression from the B17, which is providing a little more narrowness in the nose and a little more narrowness throughout to the back. So a little slimmer overall, again, we'll do a little visual comparison. See overall that shape. Uh, and I think what's really unique about when we're talking about the shape of uh, Brooks saddles is the upper profile. When we're talking shape, uh, it will sometimes effectively feel smaller than it actually physically is just due to the contours involved. So you can look on the Brooks website, they'll give you nice measurements, but sometimes seeing it in person is gonna be a little better, or in this case, the stand-in on video. So notably on the, the Swallow here, you'll see the sides are kind of completely missing. And this actually has an underside riveted support, which gives a little extra stiffness. And this is gonna be perfect for like classic road racing, classic track racing kind of style. But this is, in my opinion, great if you actually ride that classic bike. The added benefit of the minimalist profile is also reducing friction on the rider's legs and also provides a little extra support as we're, you can hear, nice and firm out of the box. Uh, and you may notice that uh, this classic saddle is one of the only ones that is only available with the classic tubular steel rivets alone. There is no copper upgrade or special variant of this saddle. Moving into a little more of the race-oriented saddle offerings, the Swift is one of my all-time favorite Brooks saddles. So here I have a nice close look here, have those nice hand-cut edge, nice large copper rivets, really a beautiful saddle. So uh, this is only available this way as a special, uh, and it is of course available in your classic three variants, antique brown, honey, or black. And this saddle may at a glance look pretty similar in shape to the B17, but the shape, this is where the shape really plays a big role. You'll notice the shape's a little more rounded, where on the B17, for example, you can see a little more definitive line and effectively, obviously a slight contour, but fairly flat. It's a pretty big supportive area where the Swift effectively, that same support area moves back to kind of off that kind of inner uh, rivet. So while the B17 is fairly broad, this is gonna be effectively a lot narrower at the rear. So much more at home if you're kind of mid position or maybe more off the nose. So this they're gonna list as a 45 degree back angle is ideal for that. And moving on again, we have the Brooks Pro. The Brooks Pro has a more traditional look, but again, a little slimmer profile. And in this case, this is the S, the shorter variant and the special of course here. Um, and this again has that kind of like narrow feeling due to the fact that it has a little higher arc in the overall profile. So I find this, although it does not look small, it does feel smaller than it looks. So again, leaning more towards that kind of road oriented geometry. And this type of shape is really only for road. I wouldn't necessarily favor this for touring. If you're thinking touring, I'd probably push you more towards uh, something like a B17. So when choosing saddles, it's really important not to only look at the saddle in a vacuum like we are right now. Uh, it's also very important to also reflect the body position on the bike. And that's another reason we have Brooks offering those degrees of back position as a little bit of a loose guide to push you into the right direction for your personal needs. So this also means how long or short your bike is uh, and the relationship of the handlebars to the saddle, also known as stack and reach, will dictate the angle on your back and therefore how your body engages with the saddle. So Brooks uses that handy guide we we're just talking about, but in short, riders that sit a little more upright or close to that 90 degree are gonna favor something a little wider, again, like something like the B67. Uh, and then if you're looking for something a little more aggressive with their back closer to that 45, we're gonna opt for something more like the Swallow, for example. So just kind of in extremes, we can see how different these saddles look. Let me move my hand so you can see a little better there. So obviously very different, but also, you know, also kind of the same. <laughs> And of course, beyond that, personal preference will come into play hugely in this. Uh, and the true test of ma is making the commitment to purchasing a Brooks saddle 
and uh, breaking it in, making it shape to you and putting in some proper mileage. So a large question we also see with Brooks is in relation to care. There's a lot of information floating about how to treat and break in a Brooks saddle. So Brooks recommends only using their products. So for example, we have the Proofide here. The Brooks Proofide isn't particularly expensive and I would highly recommend getting some because it goes very far. Um, it's extremely effective and you know, you, if you're gonna have one saddle, this will last for years. If you have multiple saddles, still probably will last for years. Um, it's not only amazing for keeping the leather uh, condition and keeping it from drying or cracking, but it's also very important in that additional break-in process. So when you're treating a new Brooks saddle, I personally like to do quite a liberal coating. Uh, you can use like a lint-free cloth or an old rag, it doesn't really matter. But I take quite a bit of care to uh, co coat the underside quite uh, openly. This is gonna be a more open pour to the leather. And I also take care to follow that edge as well, just to make sure it's very well hydrated. I'll also at this point, let it sit for minimum one hour. Sometimes I may wait even overnight and then I'll take a cloth, a clean, ideally a lint free cloth or a low lint cloth, buff it out, polish it, make sure you're removing all that excess proofide and make sure you do that before installing and riding um, because you don't want any of that transfer from this oily product onto your pants. Um, and as far as follow up and aftercare, it's really hard to give a very specific number. I wouldn't expect to need to do proof hide more than once a year, but just like if you've ever cared for a pair of leather shoes or boots, your care routine will vary very specifically to how you use it and how you care for it. Um, so if you ever scuff a Brooks saddle, for example, um, it's a very good idea to actually take that proof hide, put it back on, let it saturate, polish it out, and it'll bring that shine back up to make it look more like new. Another very common question, what do I do if I get my Brooks leather saddle wet? Don't. No. Okay, well, ideally you should avoid getting a Brooks saddle wet. Uh, and you should try to use a saddle cover or a waterproof bag anytime you're leaving it outdoors in a potentially wet condition. And in a perfect world, I would also recommend using fenders or mud guards to avoid spray from the rear wheel and additional moisture on the saddle. Uh, but of course, it's not always possible. And if it does get wet, the number one rule is try to avoid riding it wet wherever possible. Because if you saturate a Brooks leather saddle and then you actually uh, ride it, there's a good chance you're going to stretch it beyond at its intention uh, and it may deform or you know, dry unevenly, it also can lead to uh, quite unsightly staining in some of the lighter colors. So uh, effectively you're just shortening its usable lifespan, which is frankly unfortunate and should be completely avoidable. So what if the saddle is too soft? So if the saddle starts to feel too soft and have too much give while riding, there is a tension pin up in the front and we have their proprietary tool that comes with all Brooks saddles that you can actually adjust to tension. So before adjusting this, I usually would like to, I mean, if on the bike or on a firm work surface, I usually would take my palm and press it into the saddle. So this is a brand new saddle. Let's just move a couple of these so we can have a little better look. So you can see very little give because this is a brand new saddle. It's not been treated with proofied. It's quite firm and it's quite heavy duty. That's like five millimeter thick, heavy duty hide. Uh, so obviously no need to readjust this. Uh, but if it does sag or start to drop close to the rail or definitely don't want to be making contact with those rails, it's a good idea to tension it. Another side note is always avoid tensioning while wet because moisture will make it feel softer uh, and that's a great way to overstretch a saddle. Just keep in mind, leather will always stretch slightly over time, so a slight loss of tension is normal. And before adjusting the saddle, I'd recommend putting a drop of oil or penetrating oil on this nut and thread interface, just because sometimes, especially if you uh, leave your bike outside, this can get a little corroded, uh, especially if you're you know, in Canada like we are and often we oversalt our roads in the winter. Um, and whenever you're tensioning, definitely uh, make sure your nut and the bolt tension interface are moving separately because again, if you haven't adjusted this in some time, it sometimes is a little stiff. So take a little look there. You can see that nut. We have the proprietary tool fits right in there. It only allows a few degrees of movement. So you're going to have approximately an eighth of a turn. So 
do repeated tests throughout the tensioning process. Don't go crazy with it. Just take your time uh, and uh, avoid aggressive or excessive tensioning because you could cause uh, stress in the leather, cracks, or tearing if you're uh, not cautious with that. Moving on to setup. You may sometimes see noses a little bit up on a Brooks saddle. And the modern mindset is generally you wanna have your saddle quite level and sometimes you see people with a slight nose down and this is the opposite. So if you're switching from a modern gel or foam or vinyl saddle, you may have a, a little bit of experimentation in order to get what works with the Brooks. In my experience, I tend to prefer my Brooks slightly more nose forward, so a little bit in front, uh, when compared with a conventional saddle. And this is partially due to the metal nose we were talking about before. We don't really wanna be seated on that. You wanna kind of find the natural spot between the front and the back where you kind of settle. And that is why some people, like me, move their saddle forward, but in some cases move it up because they don't wanna be sliding off that of, to the nose of the saddle, which is uh, metal and obviously less comfort. You wanna be right in that kind of sweet spot. So this is of course completely dependent on your overall posture and bike fit, but the general point I'm making is uh, what might have worked previously with other styles of saddles might not work perfectly with a Brook saddle. So don't hesitate to experiment a little bit with your saddle setup and you probably won't get it perfect on your very first try. So in conclusion, Brook saddles aren't just incredible pieces of craftsmanship, they also come with a legacy of enduring comfort and timeless design. From the iconic B17 to specialized models like the Flyer, the Swallow, the Swift, and the Team Pro, each saddle offers a unique blend of comfort and functionality and are all purpose-built for different types of riders, resonating with cyclists across generations. My personal journey getting started with my first Brooks saddle revealed immediate comfort and really reinforced the brand's reputation for unparalleled support, converting me to a lifelong enthusiast. Taking good care and setting up your saddle properly, including using Proofied for maintenance and experimenting with your setup, all add to the Brooks experience, which is a seamless fusion of tradition and modernity, taking you on a timeless journey mile after mile. Thanks so much for watching and feel free to leave your comments below. We're happy to answer any further questions you have about Brooks saddles. And of course, please like and subscribe. We'll see you next time.